Hi, so my name is Anand. Um, I've been um, a long time electronics engineer. Since 2003, I've been out on my own. So mainly I do uh, customized electronics for factory testing. Yeah, so there, my background was all derived from all these tests and instrumentation here. I also belong to a group called the Hackware Design <coughs> Group that's on Facebook, of which two of the many founders are here, Chinne and Sayani. Yeah, and um, I occasionally or more like infrequently give some talks on this uh, meetup group. So last year I gave some talks on my NBIOT project, um, which isn't successful despite all the years of experience. And here I am today to share with you what these um, difficulties I had. So, what is IoT, right? So, IoT is just a collection of um, devices connected by the network to mainly collect data and possibly actuate uh, physical actions. So, you may collect um, temperature or water from a pond, and maybe um, there's not enough water, you can actuate it through remote means through IoT. So IoT is any devices that is connected to the internet. Yeah, so the possible users ranges from consumer, to commercial, and industrial infrastructure projects as well. So consumers, right, we have all these wearables of which uh, Mitch has um, explained some of them to us. We have smart home um, equipment, light bulbs, power switches, kitchen appliances, and quantum health and all that. So it's all explained here. So this talk I gave, um, um, these slides are from my previous talks. That's why you see this skip we <laughs> have. Yeah, so um, I'll just go very briefly through them, right? So despite me being an um, electronics engineer, the only internet connected gadget I have at home, um, apart from laptops and my smart TV, is a light bulb. Yeah, that's all I have at home. So my experience with internet um, gadgets is not a lot. But um, since I've been reading up for, to implement this project, I discovered that there are many, many more things out there. So for my case, right, I have a friend coming to me because he discovers that I can do electronics. <coughs> he wants to implement an IoT project for his farm, right? So it's in a remote location where he has water pumps and uh, he wants to measure the water flow and the water quality, right? So it's. In this farm, right, power and uh, wide internet is not so readily available and he wants to take several readings per hour. So this is a perfect application for internet through um, wireless transmission and that he has many locations, wiring all these sensors and gadgets is not so easy. So there are some considerations to this project. He needs long-term operation, running off batteries. If the batteries don't last, he wants it to be chargeable also. It has to be in a robust um, enclosure so that it can survive the elements outside. So the size is not a main concern here, yeah? although he wants it small enough for portability to inst for installation. So in the locations, there are possibly no Wi-Fi unless it's near his shed or a uh, farm shack. And um, we have to consider also the low data rate limitations. So the type of peripherals, he doesn't want to tell me, right? He just tells me what interfaces he wants for this project. So um, now, there are several IoT connection types. Starting with the oldest, we have the um, serial connection. Yeah, we have ethernet and fiber. So those are the ones we are not looking at. We are looking at all the wireless um, options available. There's Wi-Fi, there's uh, RFID, there's Zigbee, which is quite popular in uh, long distance and um, consume very little power. There's Bluetooth Low Energy, unfortunately that doesn't do the distance. There's Six Fox, LoRa, and lately um, the cellular companies like um, Singtel, M1, they have released a thing called the NB-IoT. So what is NB-IoT, right? Now, NB-IoT isn't easily available to us consumers. First, um, it's only available B2B. Unfortunately, that's not um, what we all can go to 7-Eleven and buy a SIM card for. So um, you have to meet up with one of their business people and then uh, 
have a long chat, blah blah blah, and then uh, maybe you get uh, evaluation SIM cards like the one I'm holding now, right? So what is NBIOT is that in, um, I'm not a cellular expert here, but these are things I picked up from the internet. What it is is that in the um, bandwidth given allotted to them by the government for cellular services, your 3G and 4G mobile phones, yeah, they take a little portion to do low data rate transmission. Yeah? Thereby, they can rely on the current infrastructure of all the cell stations they have in the country or countryside and use a small portion of their bandwidth reserved for NBIOT, narrow band. So these four statements, 4G LTE means your fourth generation long-term evolution and um, the long-term evolution is being a type of 4G which is prevalent in our modern phones. So you have the fast LTE categories, those are the ones that are used by the phones. They require high data transmission rate to support all your videos, your Facebooking, voice call, video calls and all that. Now the reserve <coughs> uh, bandwidth in this slot given allotted to them, right, is called narrow band IoT. It just uses a small subset of the bandwidth and it, it limits the uh, data rate to uh, to fit within 200 kilohertz of their um, band allotted to them. So the data rate is lowered. Yeah, despite using the same uh, frequency band for all our mobile phone support, they can still squeeze in, uh, in, in a tiny form of uh, modulation of frequency spectrum to support narrow band. Right? So they are using back the same base stations that have, they have already set inside the country. Now, they have a second um, category of narrowband IoT. It's called the LTE CAP1 or CAP M1. So this is a medium speed LTE standard, but it is also categorized under the NBIOT. So sometimes you see this terminology, um, and um, CAP dash M1 slash NBIOT. So these two things fit in the umbrella of, uh, for the usage of IoT. Right, so not knowing all these um, inner details, we use modules to support our to support our project. Yeah, so we use um, initially we started using Arduino with shields, then um, we decided to move on to the ESP32 because it supports a bigger uh, programming application. Right? So two modules are currently available. The DG's, DG's XP, yeah, this is the one here I'm holding, and another one called the SIM 7000. SIM 7000, so there are two prevalent modules currently available. So the, what my customer wanted in this project was that he supports in all of these interfaces including rechargeable batteries and a real-time clock because the ESP32 doesn't have a real-time clock for supporting deep sleep and also time sleeping. So before we started on the project, right, we had to have a rough idea of what we're dealing with. So we formed two quick tests before drawing out the PC, uh, schematics and then uh, a, a PCB. So in the first picture, we tried the same 7000C connected to an um, Leonardo, which is an Arduino, yeah. Okay, this was my first struggle. The SIM 7000C version simply cannot work. Yeah, no matter what I did in the programming, right, it just wouldn't connect to our cellular uh, uh, base stations. And the one I'm using is from Singtel, right? So it simply cannot work. We don't know why. Yeah, we, we found out later that the C the 7000C, the C really meant for China usage. <laughs> Alright, so if you're thinking of experimenting with the SIM 7000, don't use this version. Right, so the next thing that we had was the XB, right? Thankfully, my um, Leonardo has an XB connector on it. So this is a special Leonardo by DF Robot. It has two, two strips there to support the DGXB module, right? 
Okay, so we got some successes here. We managed to connect to Singtel and also to internet websites um, for data transmission and reception. So we went on with this for our project. Okay, at first, the module from Digi also did not work. Yeah, so we had to use the XB's um, test software, it's called XCPU, right? So it, it gives a whole list of parameters that you can adjust. Yeah, and the difficult things that we had to find out is where do I get this number, uh, the name STMIOT? Yeah, so we had to dig through the web, not having good support from Singtel themselves because their own application engineer is being pulled left and right, so he had hardly had time to answer phone calls. Yeah, so we found out that this one it was a stumbling block and also two more parameters, which is the band masks set for this country's, uh, also for Singtel's um, transmission. Right, the second struggle is that things still, still didn't work as well because the XB that I got was an earlier version. So it was a firmware at 1140p. So after upgrading through all the steps, it finally started to work properly. Yeah, so this is another thing that um, the websites and the web page support pages don't tell you readily, right? So you have to experiment it for yourself. So this was the second struggle. It took many, many weeks to discover all these things, and which we finally decided to... So, it, okay, the third struggle is that even after we got the connection, things broke. Why? Because the SIM card expired. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so um, after we had all our um, decisions kind of made, we started to um, make a PCB and um, this was the first version of the PCB. So, um, like our friend here says, the development of a product that is not straightforward. You just put a slap on things together on a PCB and it still works. There's a lot of testing needs to be done, right? So, this being the first version, more struggles. Huh? Okay, so I did some basic testing. I didn't bother with sleep modes yet, so I just had it operating. So, my normal CPU consumption was at 50 um, milliampers operating. That's not in sleep mode. Uh, but when it connects to the a cellular network, it consumes 151 milliampers. Right. So these numbers are important to us because we want the product or this uh, project to last a long time running on batteries. So the lower the power consumption, uh, the longer the batteries will last. So I finally um, did some testing. It works through the internet, but when I did the sleep mode, testing with the ESP32, the power consumption was good. Um, my target was um, was 100 microamperes or less. 200 is a good um, starting point. Sorry, I, I don't have a picture for that. But the CPU wouldn't wake up from sleep. So there, therein lies another struggle. Damn it, everything works. It's just the CPU won't wake up, right? so I can't put the C uh, CPU to sleep. So I could only demo it with my friend running at 56 milliampers and 150, 151 during transmission. Okay, there was a little disappointment, right? So, what's a hardware talk without some schematics? Right, so, okay, so this is my power solution for the um, electronics on this board, yeah? It's only a portion of the whole schematics, uh, but the schematics isn't very large, it's just one page. So this is a portion. So my battery charger, I relied on a benchmark, Texas Instrument 24170, right? I spent a lot of time um, reading up and configuring this IEC that I think I'm falling in love with it, yes? That I failed to pay much attention to the actual regulation of the power. Right? So the battery charger works. I like it. Yeah, it works great. The main regulators, right, I thought, hey, you know, it's just, um, it, it, it's not a full-time project anyway, right? So I just slapped on the 6-pin SOT23 bug regulator, 
hoping we will regulate 4.2 volts into 3.3 <coughs> volts required by the system, right? I felt a bit iffy, so I just slapped on another alternate LDO regulator. Yeah. My main concern for choosing the buck regulator was in the crescent current. The less the crescent current um, contributes, much lesser to the system current um, prolonging battery life. So this one's not bad. It runs at 1 milliamp operating. However, I totally overlooked the minimum operating voltage of this buck regulator. Hey, I only want 3.3 volts, right? A regulator should take just a little more and start to work, right? This one will not work at all. It was a bad choice, right? After reviewing the um, data sheets, I discovered that it required 4.75 volts to start operating. So it was already a bad choice. Um, thankfully, I had the LDO as an alternate regulator and I performed my test earlier using this one. So in this design, this first version, that regulator was totally useless, right? So now, um, um, continuing the test of the sleep mode, right? I discovered that running from 4.2 volts regulated down into 3.3 volts, even with the LDO, the ESP32 gave me problems. So that was a struggle also, right? When I first started testing, I had um, no idea what's causing the CPU to not work properly coming out of sleep mode. Until I tack on the scope, I measured the power rails. Now, it sleeps with 200 micro amperes at 3.3 volts. But during wake up, when it's restarted, right, there was a power spike in the ESP32 consumption all the way up to 200 milliamps. So I, you know, I practically went through forums and other people actually reported the same thing. Yeah, that consumption of the 200 milliamps is not from the CPU, but from the flash supporting the CPU. So what ESP32 does when it goes to sleep, <coughs> it kills itself and on wake up, it reloads the entire application firmware into ESP32. So the initial rush of program coming into the ESP32 really makes the flash work. And the flash is the one consuming much of this power spike. And I could observe on the scope, it takes about 60, 70 milliseconds, and then it stayed quiet. So ESP32, the module went into coma. <laughs> so that was the first bad design, right? OK, the second version. Wow to read up more on the um, power regulator ICs. Yeah, okay, I found some good ones, yeah? And um, this was a possible solution. Uh, it's from NS, or National Semicon had been bought over by TI. So this is a TI part now. It's LM4601. So now when I look at um, the data sheets for the power regulators, actually the part, wow, the lower the recent current of the right? So this one's quite good. It, it, it claims in its data sheet it will take only 24 micro amperes recent current. Wow, that's really small. So um, I implemented it on the second PCB. Uh, here. Yeah, and um, I measured its no load condition, right? It consumed only 42 micro amperes. Wow, elated. Then um, I went on. So I put that one that the old LDO back just in, in case that wasn't needed and um, this project started to work. So although the regulator took only 42 micro amperes, the entire system including the CPU and all the supporting um, supporting electronics, right? For the system during sleep mode, it consumed a total of 120 micro amperes, nearer and nearer towards my target of 100 micro amperes. So, okay, so, currently I have some issues with the second version. Looks like I'm going to spin for a third one. Yeah. Again, I forget to put a reset button for CPU. That's very important, yeah? When they're developing, sometimes 
Duh, the only way to reset is to run the Arduino IDE and hit upload again. Okay, so there are other things I found out about using the ESP32 module. <coughs> only some lines can be made to wake it up. Not all of them, right? So, um, okay, that third point is not important. Now, XB3 from DG is very expensive. It's 147 Sing dollars. So when I research, 18,000 is only like 21 dollars. Yeah, so, ah, no. But that's not so, not so bad, because I also made a recent discovery and I actually tested it. The same 7,000 E, I don't know what the E means. C for China, E for Europe. <laughs> ah, Europe, thank you. Okay, so that works with the Singtel SIM card. Yeah, so now my project is pushed in a totally new direction. I am going to use this new 7000E instead. Yeah, so that isn't even on the drawing board yet. Upcoming talks will be here. And then um, another recent discovery, right? I, the bug regulator I've been using is a downward voltage regulation only. So my lithium ion cell of 4.2 volts will eventually deplete and the voltage will go less and less. And then um, eventually I won't get enough voltage to supply to the system electronics. Yeah, 4.2 volts to 3.3, no problem. 4.1 to 3.3, no problem. When it reaches maybe 3.5 volts to 3.3, the pump regulator may start to behave funny. So, this new regulator that I've discovered, it was shared to me by his, um, our hackware member also. I don't know whether he's here today. Sergio Virgil, no? Okay, he shared to me, it's a bug boost regulator. If the voltage, input voltage goes below the required 3.3 volts, it will boost it upwards to 3.3. So this is a useful regulator. I can squeeze a lot of energy out of the battery, even if it goes down near the limit of 2.5 volts. So other bug regulators exist, but may be expensive. So, is my project open hardware? No, not yet. <laughs> I'm too frightened, I'm too embarrassed. It doesn't work yet, right? Most of the times I see on the web of all these open source hardware projects, they're fully working, fully tested, you know? And that's what they call a release. So I'm too embarrassed to put it up on the web just yet. But my third version is coming. So with that, um, I end my talk. Right.